In this video I'm going to take a look at ideal gases. So the first thing we're going to look at is converting between Celsius and Kelvin, which is going to be the scale you'll be using for temperature from now on. You'll need to be able to draw various types of curves for each of the three different laws. You'll also need to describe the key features of an ideal gas and how to use the ideal gas equations to calculate unknowns, and I'll show you some examples for that at the end of this video. So let's get started. So, we're going to start using the Kelvin scale when we're dealing with ideal gases. We're not really very interested in the Celsius, and you'll see why as we move through this. So the Kelvin scale makes the lowest possible temperature in the entire universe zero. So there can be no negative Kelvins. So zero K is that minimum temperature. And at that point, the all molecules have the minimum possible kinetic energy. So they don't have no kinetic energy, but they have the, so if you look at their vibrations, like all molecules at all times are vibrating. Let's say it's vibrating this much. As we increase the temperature, those are going to increase. So essentially the higher the temperature, the more vibration, the more kinetic energy. So that's actually quite useful because the Kelvin scale you can actually find the energy of the particles is directly proportional to the temperature, which is a really useful phenomenon in the equations we're going to move on to. So how do you convert between the two? Essentially, it's using this equation on here. So you take your temperature in Celsius, and you add this value, 273.15, onto it. That gives you in Kelvin. Most of the time, you'll probably find yourself just adding 273. It depends what the precision of the temperature you're given is, and you should match that. Okay, so that's how you convert between those two, and you'll see that used quite a bit in the examples later on. Okay, so let's look at Boyle's Law. So Boyle's Law states that at a constant temperature, pressure and volume of a gas are inversely proportional, or the pressure multiplied by a volume is a constant. So you can see this graph in two different forms. So if we do a P versus V curve, um, you get something that looks like this. So you get these lines. And what you can see here is as you increase the temperature, your curve shifts sort of diagonally up to the right here. So these are three different temperatures, and this is the relationship between pressure and volume. Now, as you know, if you want to prove a inversely proportional relationship, you should demonstrate that P is proportional, in this case your y, is equal to k over v if it is inversely proportional. So if we put pressure against 1 over volume, what you'd expect to find is a graph like this. And you'd expect as you increase your, just as before, your k is going to change as you increase your temperature just like it was before. There's two different ways of looking at Boyle's law due to the inverse proportional relationship. There's Boyle's law, so let's move on to Charles's law. The Charles's law states that at constant pressure, the volume and temperature of gas are directly proportional. So we only need one graph this time. So we can put volume against temperature, remembering that temperature we're going to be using in the Kelvin scale and we will get a graph that looks like this. Because it's directly proportional, so it must go through the origin, which is why we're using the Kelvin scale, because that makes this neatly tie up. So this zero point here is zero Kelvin. So what it's saying is this gas occupies zero volume when it's at absolute zero, essentially. So let's move on to the final part, which you might C coming, one we haven't looked at. So the pressure law says that at constant volume, pressure and temperature are directly proportional, again in the Kelvin scale. So you'd expect to get a graph just like this because we're using Kelvin. Okay, so those three separate laws can be useful, but they're even more useful when you can essentially put them all together to form some key equations. 
Now, before we look at those equations, the equations for our ideal gas, I want to explain what an ideal gas is and some characteristics of gases in general. There's a few things that apply to any type of gas. First of all, one mole occupies a fixed volume of 24.3 litres. So, you might see this sometimes called decimeters cubed and said, same thing. So, what is a mole? One mole is 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23 atoms. And that number, this 6.02, blah, 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 is called Avogadro's constant, and you might see it given the symbol capital N subscript A. Also, the relative atomic mass, so the number given in the periodic table, indicates the mass of one mole of a particular element or a molecule in grams. So, uh... Yeah, sorry, no SI units here. They uh, seem to like the grams. So, uh, annoying, but chemists get thrown back later on, so fair enough. Anyway, so you quite often see it in this type of notation here. So you've got the proton number Z, so you've got the, the RAM, or the relative atomic mass, sometimes called nuclide number as well, up there. Just occasionally you see the relative atomic mass down here if they're giving it to more decimal places because they want to show how it's different to the nuclear the nucleon number there. So what makes a gas an ideal gas rather than a real gas, I suppose? First of all, it assumes all collisions are perfectly elastic. So this is linking to some of the stuff from Unit 4. So total kinetic energy is conserved in collisions of gas molecules. Second thing is, there is assumes that there is no intermolecular forces between gas molecules. Now those of you who do chemistry will know that there are obviously uh, forces, and you might know them as van der Waals forces. We're not getting into our hydrogen bonding or any of that other sort of stuff. So there are these van der Waals forces, so this is where chemistry laughs at physics for this point. Well, hey, um, so you can read more about that if you want, but I'm going to move on. Because from now on, we're going to assume almost all gases behave as ideal gases. And if they're either low temperature, low pressure even, and high temperature, that's a pretty valid assumption to make. So let's have a look at the ideal gas equations. So there are two, depending on what information you've been given. So this one here, PV equals NRT, is your ideal gas equation. And that deals with situations where you've been given or can calculate the number of moles of a gas. And you can use the molar gas constant to convert, and that's your R there. If instead you've been given the number of molecules, you can use the number of molecules and this K, the Boltzmann constant, to link pressure, volume and temperature. And as you can see, the relationship shown by each of the three laws before holds for each of these equations here. So let's look at some examples and see these equations in action. So. You've got a gas at 100 kilopascals at a temperature of 27 degrees, and you then heat it up at constant volume to 150 kilopascals. So let's look at trying to show that the new temperature is this, the 177 degrees centigrade. So first of all, constant temperature. Remembering in this particular scenario, you're going to use this relationship here. Sorry, constant volume. What am I talking about? We're going to use this relationship here. P is KT. And we're going to rearrange that slightly into K is equal to P over T. Now we know this constant isn't going to change, so we can put it in a slightly different form. So the pressure initially and the temperature initially are equal to the pressure after divided by the temperature after. And we are looking to calculate the temperature after, so let's do that. Temperature after is going to be pressure times by the initial temperature and then divide that by your pressure. And we can put these numbers in. So 
We've got your second pressure, 150 times 10 to the 3. And this is the point where we need to do our Kelvin conversion. So it's 27 plus 273 to make sure it's in Kelvin. And then divide by the original pressure. And this comes out at... Hey presto, you're not going to believe it. Um, or well, not quite at that stage yet. It comes out at 450. Remembering we've calculated an answer in Kelvin. So that means your temperature is going to be converting that back. And this is where you get your 177 degrees Celsius. Here. So we can flick onto the next page where it's a bit neater and laid out. We've got those stages here going through and you can read anything that maybe was illegible before. So let's move on to a couple of more examples. So we've got one mole of nitrogen gas is 0.028 kilograms. And we've got a flask containing 0.014 kilograms. So I'll ask you to calculate the number of molecules in the flask. So the first stage is to work out the number of moles. So this is how much we have. Divided by the mass of one mole, which you can conveniently see is pretty much half. So you have 0.5 moles. And then, so then remembering how to convert to molecules using your Avogadro constant so 0 0.50 times by your constant and that gives you uh, I think most of you can see this so times 10 to the 23 molecules Okay, that's, so we've got half a mole, essentially. And then, same flash, uh, flask of nitrogen has a volume of 1.0 times 10 to the 4 centimetres cubed. Calculate the pressure at 27 degrees. So we're going to be using our ideal gas equation here. So the first stage is we need to convert our volume into the SI unit of metres cubed. So 1.0 times 10 to the 4 centimetres cubed. There are 1 million centimetres cubed in a, deci in a decimeter cubed, or, or sorry, a metre cubed even. Um, so that must mean there are this many metres cubed here. So we've got our volume. So remembering how we can get our pressure in our T divided by our volume. Remembering we had 0 0.50 moles times by our constant, so 8.31, because we're using moles in this case, times by our temperature, which is 300, or 273 plus 27, divided by 1.0 times 10 to the minus 2. And you put all those numbers in, you come out with 1.2 times 10 to the 5 pascals. And again, we've used two sig figs, so your answer here should be to two significant figures. And for those of you who can't read my here are some nice, neatly laid out workings for you to have a look at.